I'm delighted to be here. What a pleasure to, to share this conference with you. Uh, uh, Deb asked me if I might say a few observations about how this conference uh, compares. We, we do our own conferences annually, and so I'm, I, I've gotten quite good at looking at details of how conferences work. And I, I think it's worth taking just a minute to, to congratulate the staff at EOA for pulling off a truly magnificent, well-engineered, and well-choreographed conference. So thank you so much. I would like to uh, talk about a hypothetical future world with you for just a minute before I get into the substance of my, my talk. Uh, so imagine somebody now talking to a friend and they say uh, something about where they might do some shopping and they mention John Lewis and Debenhams. Oh, and John Lewis, that's an employee-owned company. What if employee ownership were the default? What if that conversation was John Lewis and Debenhams? Oh yes, Debenhams, that's the investor-owned company. Maybe we'll get there sometime. What I see here today makes me optimistic that Britain, that the UK is heading in that direction. And I'd like to share with you how the United States is, is pursuing that same, uh, the same direction, some of the struggles we've had, some of the successes. And I'll, I'll do that in three parts, if you'll indulge me. And uh, the, the, the third part, I'd like to uh, issue a challenge to each of you personally. Uh, the first is, let me tell you briefly about employee ownership in the United States, uh, the extent and, and where we are. I'll give you some examples from some real employee-owned companies and, and show you a video. Second, I'd like to talk a little bit about the impact. Uh, we have some wonderful research about the impact of employee ownership that I'd like to share some highlights with you of. And then third, I'd like to talk about some lessons uh, for you to consider to see if they might be useful for your companies and the advancement of employee ownership here in the UK. So let me start with just a brief overview of the National Center for Employee Ownership, if I can work the clicker. Ah, there we go. So we're a, a nonprofit organization. Our sole mission is to provide practical resources and objective, reliable information about employee ownership. Uh, we've been around for over 30 years, and our, our founder, Corey Rosen, is still coming into the office more, more days than not. And we're delighted to still have him. We have about 3,300 members, and uh, a mem our largest membership category are companies that are employee-owned. Uh, so we have uh, a pretty healthy resource to draw on. And we're located in Oakland, California. I'm going to take you on a quick little employee ownership tour of Oakland part way through. We do a lot of things in common with the EOA. We do a whole lot of publications. We do ongoing research, although the, the ownership effect initiative that, uh, that you have here is, is truly inspiring. We do events, uh, an annual conference, some online meetings, and we also do a, a lot of, we call it outreach, as businesses, you might call it uh, marketing. So the extent of employee ownership in the United States now is that there are about 23 million employee owners, uh, people who work for companies where they own, have some ownership stake in the company. And if the most generous definition possible of employee ownership, if you look just at people who work for companies that have stock, about 54% of the workers in those companies have either stock a right to stock, stock options, some stock-like device. There are about 6,700 companies that have an employee stock ownership plan. I'm going to focus on uh, employee ownership plans uh, with the research that we've got. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why we're focusing on employee ownership, uh, on ESOPs as a form of employee ownership. But let me tell you, these are the forms of employee ownership that we have available in the United States, the menu of employee ownership. So you'll get familiar with employee stock ownership plans as we go along. We've got lots of research on them, and in some ways, they're the best uh, comparison to the, the way employee ownership works here in the UK. We also have worker cooperatives. We have a long, proud tradition of worker cooperatives, not, not as long as your tradition, of course, with Rochdale. But uh, we, have, uh, we have a number of co-ops here. We have about 500 worker co-ops in the United States, and they have somewhere around 5,000, oh, sorry, 4,000 workers in them. The majority of those workers actually work for a single large cooperative, Cooperative Home Care Associates in New York. The second category, oh, and I should say worker cooperatives, although they are small relative to ESOPs, they're having a bit of a renaissance now. There's a, there's a new energy and momentum behind them. 
uh, partly because the worker co-op uh, world has gotten itself more organized and partly because there's been an infusion of funding for them to, to do work from foundations in the United States. In equity compensation, that's a large catch-all category for stock options, stock purchase plans, direct stock purchases, and rights to uh, cash value linked to stock. Uh, these are largely in firms that are listed or companies that are in the technology startup business, the Silicon Valley. This is, uh, this is an important part of the US market, but it's very diverse, and a, a fair chunk of it is aimed specifically at executives. So it's not, the, it's not a very apt comparison for what, what many of you are doing. Direct ownership is where people simply own shares in their company. Maybe it's a gift from the company management. Maybe they've purchased them possibly at a discount. And there's no central data at all on direct ownership. Uh, there's a fair amount of it, but nobody knows how much. So we don't have good research data to report on that. And then we also now have perpetual trusts, and I'd like to thank you for that. This is something that we've uh, borrowed directly from you. In fact, uh, Graham Nuttall came to some of our conferences and set up some uh, companies owned by perpetual trusts in the United States, at least in some cases. The trust is based in the UK, although it's a US company, so I want to thank you for that. But for now, we're focused mostly on ESOPs, Employee Stock Ownership Plans. And the, some of the reasons that that's the best comparison are they tend to have a large ownership percentage. Uh, there are a healthy number of firms. They tend to be broad-based. They include all or almost all employees. So let me tell you a little bit about ESOPs and how they work in the United States. They are a trust, so the employees do not directly own the shares where they work. The trust owns it on their behalf. They have a right to the cash value of those shares, generally at retirement, because in, in the United States, ESOPs are governed by retirement plan law. So as far as the federal government is concerned, it's largely uh, something to be very conservatively managed, because they're very concerned about the cash value of their of retirement accounts. Uh, trusts, ESOP trusts can own any portion of the company's shares from a half a percent to a hundred percent. The transactions by which trusts acquired shares are often financed, often by an outside institution, sometimes by the person selling the shares to the trust. Oops, premature. And we have in the United States some quite generous tax incentives uh, that apply either to the seller, the company, uh, to, to the seller and to the company and to the, uh, and to the employees when they, when they uh, retire and receive their cash value. Because it's retirement plan, we have quite a healthy amount of regulation. We, we spoke about that in yesterday's session a bit. I won't go on here. But the requirements for an employee voice and governance are fairly minimal you know, for most ESOPs. So I won't go into detail on this slide except to point out this fifth line down. This is the number, the 6,700 that I mentioned before, about the number of plans in the United States, the number of ESOP plans. We have another, about 3,000 that are plans that are very similar to an ESOP but don't quite meet the definition. You can see we've got about 13.6 million participants in those ESOPs. The majority of those participants are in listed companies, although the majority of companies are private companies. So a lot of what I'll talk to you about are the 5,500 uh, 5, uh, privately held companies with pure ESOPs and uh, the employees that they have, just under a, a million. The industries are very, very similar to the distribution in the, uh, in the UK, with the exception that we have more in, in finance and real estate, and uh, you have more in professional, scientific, and technical. Uh, just some quick numbers. Uh, the most common size in this way of bracketing sizes is between 100 and 500 employees, although we do have some that are much smaller. The smallest member company we had had a, a four-person ESOP. The largest has about 153,000 participants in their ESOP. And then the percentage owned by the ESOP, this is from a, a member survey, it's not representative of, of all ESOPs, but the most common membership percentage is 100% of the shares. And that's because of one of the more recent tax incentives now. OK, so let me take you on a tour of a few ESOP companies. And I picked these to be a little bit uh, diverse and representative of, of what companies are like. This is a manufacturing company called Hypertherm. And they make these uh, plasma cutters for cutting metal and a whole bunch of other stuff. They've got about uh, 1,500 employees. They have a no layoff policy. They've never laid anybody off. And they also have something that they call the Hypertherm Institute, which is an in-house uh, training program that trains people in, in not just business literacy, but job skills and other more general professional development skills. 
The next company I wanted to show you is a much smaller company. They, they make manufacture pool covers for swimming pools. They've got under 100 employees, and they have something called a CEO program, a Certified Employee Owner Program, which goes through some of the similar content as the Hypertherm Institute. They also practice open book management, and if you'll permit me, I'd like to tell you just one story about pool covers. They, their business is driven by the fate of the housing market, and when our housing market had such difficulties, they had a terrible uh, time, They're, and everybody saw the downturn in the numbers because they continued to share their financial results. So they had an all-staff meeting to talk about how the company collectively wanted to manage this downturn, and they decided that there was no alternative to layoffs. So during this meeting, they had a few people raise their hand and offer to be the ones who were laid off, because these were the people who knew that they didn't have a family and they could afford to be laid off better than other employees at the company. Here's Mission Bell. They're a company that makes this, this woodwork. They're a commercial uh, milling company. Uh, their clients are companies like Google, and they use a lot of reclaimed wood. And the one interesting thing about Mission Bell is that they took very seriously the idea of process improvement. So they had all of their woodworking machines set up, nicely working, and they had the, the employees video their own stations about how the process worked. Then they went through an exercise in process improvement, and they had the employees make those process improvements, then re-video their work process so that they could share the process improvements all around the company. So there's, uh, there's not a whole lot of high technology in mill work, but another company is ATA Engineering. They're a, a small engineering firm in Southern California. They work on roller coasters, cell phone covers, and the Mars rover. So they helped create this, and one of the interesting things about them is they decided that it's extremely important for them to make their hiring decisions very slowly and carefully. And they realized that the only way they could do that is by focusing their hiring on times when business was bad, because that was the only time they had enough free staff time to invest in making the hires at the quality level that they wanted. So we've got some pretty diverse companies. Let me take you through a, a quick list. Here's an export company, a publisher, another publisher, a home healthcare organization. This is a company that does PR and, uh, and uh, marketing research. And this is an environmental consultant and a company that does consulting in how to conserve energy. What ties all these together is these are all companies that I can walk or bike to from our office in downtown Oakland. And if I did that, I would probably end up here at a company called Zachary's Chicago Pizza, which is employee-owned and celebrates we have employee ownership month in, in October. Uh, and it's a wonderful place. I thought I'd mention their, the structure by which they became employee-owned, because I know it's useful for some of you here. Uh, the two owners sold small portions of shares. They, they sold 5%, 7% depending on the profitability of the company, until the employees owned 43%, and then they took out a loan to buy the other 57%. So that's a, a quick tour. You could take similar walking tours. All these dots represent employee-owned companies in St. Louis or Tampa, Minneapolis. Uh, what ties all these together is uh, that they're all on a website, esopinfo.org. If you're interested in looking through maps of the United States to see where employee-owned companies, that's one way to do it. Let me briefly mention this company, Recology. They're, uh, they're a waste management company, and they serve the city of San Francisco, as well as several others on the West Coast. And they've been 100% employee-owned for, for decades. They actually were formed when a number of worker cooperatives merged into a single company. And at this point, I'm, I'm cleverly transitioning from the first point, which is the scope of employee ownership in the United States, and with some examples, to the impact of employee ownership. I wanted to show you this picture. This is uh, on the left. That's Ayana Banks. She's a 17-year employee at uh, Recology. She's the mother of two, and she credits her employment at Recology with her ability to have a, provide a stable livelihood for her kids and get them into college. Uh, college works a little differently for us. It, it can be, it's one of the most hard financial burdens on, on parents. This is Ayana running a toy drive. Uh, the little girl on the right is one of the beneficiaries of that. Uh, and that's something that, that Recology has supported for years. We've got some nice documentation, and there's a, a study that we created a separate website for, this ownershipeconomy.org. Let me very quickly run through this for you, because it's something I'm pretty excited about. Uh, it's from the federal government, so it, it's uh, by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it's a panel data, so they re-interview the same people every year ongoing. The most recent one was uh, when these people were aged 28 to 34, so 
since ESOPs are re a retirement plan, this is the group on which you'd expect employee ownership to have the smallest impact. So when you look at the, what we found, and forgive me for those of you who were in the yesterday's session, uh, but the median household net wealth for the people who are employee owners was 92% greater than for the non-employee owners. Their income from wages was 33% higher, and they had 53% greater job tenure. <laughs> and a bit over a year when you're in that uh, 28 to 34 age bracket is, is a fair amount. Uh, so what's been interesting to us is that it's not that the employee-owned companies simply are able to hire the best because they're employee-owned. If you look at the wage over time, the employee owners and the non-employee owners started out at just about exactly the same place, and that difference emerges over time. So it's being an employee owner that, that creates the, the wealth and income benefit of employee ownership. And it's interesting that this, uh, this difference persists for all the different demographic groups that we were able to look at with this data. So it works for higher educated, for lower educated, for people in jobs with higher prevailing wages and lower prevailing wages, people who are parents or non-parents, people of different ethnic groups and demographic backgrounds. So it's across the, the board in, in the economy, the impact of employee ownership. That only works because there is a performance advantage from employee ownership. Employee-owned companies outperform non-employee owners. I've got a couple statistics here, but it applies not just to productivity and employment growth. It also applies to sales growth, to, uh, to, uh, to a re reduced number of, of layoffs. The, uh, it applies to the very, very low default rate, 0.2% per year, on the loans that finance employee ownership in the United States. So if we look at all this, I'm going to transition now from the, the research highlights about the impact of employee ownership to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that might be worth, uh, that might be interesting for you to consider. So employee ownership works well at some companies, but not at all. At some companies, it's, uh, it, it doesn't have much of an effect at all. We have some wonderful research that the first study to look at this was a, a government study from 1986, but it's been repeated by ourselves and outside academics in different forms over the years. And what separates the employee-owned companies that do well from the employee-owned companies that see no benefit from employee ownership is employee participation. It's making sure people have a voice in how their company works. So uh, one way to look at that is that it's not enough to put out employee ownership, to make sure everybody has shares and then say, all right, everybody, do your thing. Go. Uh, what we found is that you really need to create structures. You really need to work to create employee ownership. And there are a lot of ways to do that. And that's what I'd like to spend this, the remainder of this talk talking about, are what are the things that you can do to make employee ownership real? And as I've listened to people at this uh, conference, I'm saying a lot of the same things that you've already heard. The, the talk from Union Industries actually took almost exactly what I was going to say, which is that employee ownership is hard work. Uh, Mrs. S. and Andy spoke a, a bunch about what goes into uh, employee ownership and it's hard work. So what is that hard work? Last year's keynote speaker, or one of last year's keynote speaker was this guy, Jack Stack. How many of you here were here to hear uh, Jack? Okay, good. So a very quick overview. Jack uh, runs a company called SRC Holdings, and they make diesel motors. They remanufacture diesel motors. You can see him sitting on one there. And uh, they brought the company back from the brink of bankruptcy in 1983. And since then, they've created a whole system for making employee ownership real by open book management, teaching people how to understand the financial statements, and keeping them informed about the, about the health of the company, and giving them things to do, connecting what each person does in their day-to-day -day work life to the success of the company. And they've had some astounding results. They're the most innovative company, according to Bink, Inc. Magazine. Their stock price has gone up by 435,000 percent since the uh, company uh, brought back from bankruptcy in 1983. They've created 60 new business units that they have since spun off into entirely new businesses, and they've been featured in over 100 business books in the United States. 
to me, one of the most amazing things that Springfield Remanufacturing has done is inspire other companies. Here's one of them. A new Belgium company makes beer, and they've learned the uh, open book management lesson from SRC. They do intense training, they do communication along the lines of that Hypertherm Institute and the CEO program. So when you look at this, when you look at the impact that employee ownership has on SRC and New Belgium and some of these results about, uh, about the data, then it looks like magic, doesn't it? If we could create other policies or other business practices that had comparable impact, we'd do them in a heartbeat. So employee ownership looks like the magic solution to both how our businesses operate and what we want to have happen in our societies. But I tell you, it's the opposite of magic. Just as Mrs. S said, it's hard work. Uh, it's, it takes hard work, it, and magic only works when there's a magician up on stage who knows a secret that everybody else in the audience doesn't know. So employee ownership is the opposite of magic because your employees are not in the audience and they need to know the secret if this is going to work well. So it takes hard work, it takes information transparency, it takes a carefully thought out system of how you share information and educate people in the books, it takes a lot of training. And it also takes persistence. It takes uh, people, if, if you look at the great game approach, you might be thinking it, it's talking about WIFM, which stands for what's in it for me. Do we, does employee ownership mean that uh, everybody's working from, their prof from a profit motive? And I'd tell you that if you do the great game of business, if you get people to understand how employee ownership benefits them, that's a necessary first step, but it's not enough. People need to do more than understand what's in it for me. And let me just share with you uh, some data from the Ownership Culture Survey, which is uh, an employee attitude survey that we use frequently at the, uh, with employee-owned companies. And I won't uh, do a lot of the, the details on this, but we have a number of companies that have used it so far. And we classify people into champions, uh, skeptics, and cynics based on that. Here's the average across those 20,000 employees. You can see we've got a small number of cynics, we've got a fair number of champions, but there's a pretty big distribution, which I think is what you expect, given that employee ownership is still the exception and not the norm. But let me show you data from two companies. Here's one, company A. They've got a whole lot more cynics, and they've barely got any champions. Company B, this company is the opposite. They've got the most champions that we've seen anywhere, and they have absolutely no cynics or skeptics. So what do we learn from this? If I told you that one of these companies contributes the near the maximum possible to the ESOP, which one would you guess it is? B, thank you. It's actually uh, company A. Company A has been incredibly generous with the size of its contributions to the ESOP. But company B has been working really hard to, uh, to make employee ownership seem and feel real to its, uh, to its employee owners. So one thing I think we learned from that is that uh, company B has been persistent. They've been working on this for years. They've taken chances. They've uh, tried creative new things. And they've done this survey for a long time, and their board of directors holds the management team accountable for the results of the survey. Uh, the management team has an incentive to improve the scores on the survey and drive as many people as they can to be champions, which means that the management team uh, works really hard. One of the things they've done is to, is to focus on difficult conversations. They've, they've, they've used a book which is called Difficult Conversations, and they have everybody in the workforce go through a training session every year about how to have difficult conversations so that everybody in the workforce can hold everybody else on the workforce accountable for doing employee ownership right. Profit is, is oxygen. It's, we, our businesses need it to survive, but it's not the point. Let me show you one way that some companies have approached the idea of getting people engaged and feeling a sense of responsibility for the business, which is uh, Padilla CRT is a, uh, an employee-owned company, and they've put together a scheme of rights and responsibilities. So the idea that for every right that employees want to have as owners, there's a responsibility that goes along with that right. Uh, if I want to have the right to have information about the business, then I have a responsibility to learn how to use that information for the best interest of the business. Let me uh, mention, just in summary, these are what I see as four themes that, that capture a lot of the lessons I've heard at the conference today and yesterday. 
uh, what works? It, it, it takes time to invest in the hard work of doing the training, of doing the great game of business or other similar things. It takes time to build the participation systems, not to allow participation, but to seek it out, to build it into the day-to-day -day lives of people at your businesses. It takes time to measure your progress toward building the culture and the behaviors that you want to have in your business. And it makes sense, and I apologize for a, a baseball analogy here, I'm hoping you can cricketify it for me, uh, but to swing for the fences, to really try some dramatic, exciting things and see if you can, if you can pull them off. Uh, the, the point of employee ownership isn't to play it safe. So I'm going to close with this last thought, which is that, does anybody recognize this? It's the old Pepsi can. Pepsi spent $500 million to announce nothing but the change to this. No change in the product. It was all about the color scheme and the design of the can. Now, the fact is that Pepsi is willing to spend enormous amounts of money on their brand. And the brand of each one of you depends on what happens with all other employee-owned companies in the United Kingdom. This is a responsibility. You're part of a community of employee ownership. And whether people think of employee ownership as a wonderful thing or an OK thing or a bad thing depends on what happens in real life. So I would encourage you to tell your story. Here's some employee owners. They invited their senator in to visit them. And that's him in the back right, uh, learning about employee ownership from the, uh, from the employees. So tell your story. Make an effort to talk about what works about employee ownership in your business. And you can do that by working with the EOA. That's a wonderful way to share your story, to build the UK-wide brand of employee ownership. To, you can get involved in the members' council, you can talk to the EOA staff. But if you tell your story, that benefits everybody. And it makes it far more likely in that hypothetical future conversation that people will talk, start talking about companies and remember the days back in the olden times of the investor-owned company. Thank you.